Hi, my name is Mark Moore. I'm the author of the book, Early Genesis, The Revealed Cosmology. I think there's a link in the description section to his Amazon page. I've got a tough job today, and that is because I want to show you, and many people are just so convinced that I would have this wrong, but I want to show you from the scriptures why this teaching that angels are also the sons of God and that God has this heavenly family of divine beings, and then there's this earthly family that are also his sons, why that teaching is mistaken. And I can see why people would, would see the, get the teaching that way. There are certain things in the Old Testament that point that way. And so it was confusing. And the Jews of Jesus' day and, and beyond were confused by it. They brought some ideas with them, I believe, from, from Babylon, from the captivity. And those ideas influenced the way they saw things. And the church mostly didn't mess with that during its early history. But now, suddenly, some scholars have dusted off these old Jewish ideas that, frankly, were held by the factions of Jews that did not accept Jesus as Messiah. And they're trying to insert that into doctrine and belief in the church. Fortunately, we have the New Testament to illuminate the Old Testament. And so that's where I want to start. I want to start with Hebrews, and you will see, and then we'll go through the New Testament verses, and you'll see that, well, gee, there's a conflict between what the New Testament says about angels and their role and who the sons of God are, and what this teaching tells me that these Old Testament verses seem to say. And you'll understand that there's, there's a paradox there, and then we're going to go through and try to resolve the paradox. So, that said, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something I'm afraid that's, that's a little difficult. I'm going to show a long passage on the screen, two long passages, and I'm going to do a voiceover. So you will not have anybody here as a, a video or talking head, but you'll see the scriptures, and we're not going to flip from verse to verse with a bunch of narrative in between that tries to connect two things that, that may, or not, may or may not really be connected, but rather we're going to take you through the writer's thought processes as he goes through a long passage of scripture. And so I would ask you to bear with me as we go through that process, be like the Bereans who are more noble, to study these things and see if they are so. Let's start with Hebrews. Thank you. Hebrews chapter 1, starting with the fifth verse. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. The writer of Hebrews is quoting the Old Testament. Throughout this passage, he quotes the 8th Psalm, he quotes various Old Testament passages, and he's asking his audience a rhetorical question. He's basically challenging them, showing them the superiority of Christ to the angels, saying that he is a son, they are not. That's really the whole point of Hebrews chapter 1. And then in chapter 2, he expands that superiority to us, as we will see. So if there was, if it was obvious from the Old Testament that God was calling angels his sons, it would sort of ruin the point of this question. If that's what they all believed, this passage wouldn't work. Because they could say, oh, well, he's in, in Job 37 or Job 38, he's saying they're his sons. And in these various other passages, they're called his sons and so on and so forth. But the writer of Hebrews is acting like, no, that's not what they believed. Let's keep reading. And again, when he brings in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. He's quoting all Old Testament verses here, showing that angels in the Old Testament had a lower station than the sun. That, that's the whole point of what he's saying here. They're ministers, they're ministering spirits, they're a flame of fire, 
but they are not the son who is to be worshipped. But under the sun, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with oil of gladness above thy fellows. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall all wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years not, shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, there's another one of those rhetorical questions. Basically, he's saying the sun has one position and these angels have another lower position. Verse 11, are they not, or verse 14 rather, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. And this is where he begins showing, yes, the sun is above the angels. And those of us who are in the sun, our life is in him. So are we. There is a distinction between the sons and the angels. And that is what this is saying. They are ministering spirits. They are sent forth to minister to who? To those of us who will be heirs of of salvation. It's not like their sons up there and we're sons down here. We are the sons. They are ministering to us. That should humble you and not make you arrogant because angels are greater and mightier in power than we are at this time. But yet, and we are made lower than them at this time, as we shall see. But nevertheless, we are like that, that infant, that little child, who though they are a little child, eventually they will be promoted above the stewards of the house. Let's go on and look at the second chapter of Hebrews where, because what, what some say is, oh, well, he's talking about Christ here. He's not being above the angels. He's not talking about us. Just keep reading. Just keep reading. Chapter two, and here we see at the start of it in verse 14, takes what God has said about the son and applies it to those of us whose life is in him. We are the members of the body of Christ. Let's read on. For under the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. And of course we know that there is going to be a world to come. We know that we will rule and reign with Christ in that world. So they are not a part of that. And I'm going to go on and explain why and what the relationship is like, but let's read on. But one in a certain place testified saying, and this is the eighth Psalm. What is man that thou art mindful of him or the son of man that thou visiteth him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. And that's, that's the end of his quote. And then he says, for in that he's put all things in subjection under him, he's left nothing that is not put under subjection to him. So, and he says, we don't see all that yet. We don't see it. Not yet, but we're going to. And so this is not the angels he's giving this world to come to. It is, it is us, even though right now we are a little lower than the angels. But you know who else was a little lower than the angels? Look at verse 9. But we see Jesus. So we don't see the world to come yet, but we do see Jesus, who is the first fruits of that world to come. We see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So the same phrase is used in verse 7 and 9, made a little lower than the angels. And in many translations, verse 9 is translated for a little while lower than the angels. And the Greek is obscure in verse 7 and 9, but if it is fair to translate verse 9 a little while lower than the angels, then it is also fair to translate it in verse 7 for a little while lower than the angels. In other words, Jesus is not going to wind up lower than the angels. He just, he lowered himself to become us, to die for us, to bring many sons into glory. And now he is above the angels. And we too are made a little lower than the angels, but everything is going to be put under subjection. Everything that he has made is going to put, be put under subjection to man in Christ. Even the angels. They are like the stewards of the house. And we, as we are now, are like the children of the house. Right now, they know more than us. They are more capable than us. They are greater in understanding and power than we are. Because we're children, because we are not yet like what we shall be. But when that day comes, we, as we read on, you will see, we will be brethren. We will be in Christ. We will be part of the body of Christ. And, and it says in another place that we shall judge angels. They will still be the stewards. And then we will be ruling and reigning with Christ. So it's, it's, we are lower than they are now, just as a child is lower than a steward of the house when they were a child, but when they were grown up, they become one of the masters of the house. And that should not make us arrogant or cocky. It should make us humble that God could ever raise us above where the angels are now, because now they are above us. Let me read on for it became him for whom are all things and by whom all things are made in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are being made one in him and through him, and by him. And then he quotes a scripture in verse 12, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And, and so you know, this is a situation where because of the work of Christ, we become from what we are to what we're going to be in him. And it, it ends off in verse 14. It says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So the children are partakers of flesh and blood. In other words, they are not angels. So Jesus himself likewise took part of the same. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them through who? the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage glory for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but took on him the seed of abraham wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren don't you see folks his brethren are us not the angels to be made like his brethren he had to be made like us not like them the people that are teaching you that god has this heavenly family of sons and their spirit beings and he has this earthly family of sons and their people they are not teaching you what the new testament says about angels and the sons of god 
Let's go on. There's one, there's one more place in the New Testament we're going to look at, and then we're going to find what the Old Testament has to say. I want to speak to a passage, and really the account is given in Matthew and Mark and in Luke. So it shows up in three of the four Gospels where Jesus is given a scenario so that a man takes a wife, he dies, his brother takes the wife, the brother dies, there's another brother, he takes the wife, then he dies, and goes on and on, and, and they say, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus says in all three places, nobody's, they're not going to marry, they're not going to be given in marriage in the king world to come. They will be like the angels. And some of them might think, well, if we're like the angels, then it feeds into this, okay, God's got a family of sons that are angels. He's got a family of sons that are people. And once we go to the other side, we'll be like the other members of the family. And that's not what this is saying. And of the three passages, Luke is the one that makes this clear. So I've got the others, they don't contradict it, but they don't give enough detail either. Luke does. So chapter 20, verse 36, I have the interlinear. It has the Greek, English words below it. And then I've got in the lower right-hand corner, the King James translation of this verse. One thing I do not like about the King James translation is that it has children of God in it and children of the resurrection. The Greek word there is routinely translated son. That's what it should be here, son of God. But Luke goes into detail, the other two do not. And if you translate it with the correct punctuation, which the King James has follows the Greek punctuation better, it's clear that being a, like the angels means being like the angels in respect of death does not apply to you anymore. You have the power to keep living. That's how we're equal to the angels, in immortality. But then there's a punctuation mark there, and it says more about us and are the children of God or and are the sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So... It's making it more clear when translated properly, and not every version does, that there's one thing we're like the angels. We are not going to die. And here's something else we are. We're the sons of God. It is not connected to being like the angels. Being the sons of God is not connected. It's just something else that we are in the age to come. So... Not every translation of Luke 20, 36 makes that clear. So I wanted to show you the Greek. I wanted to show you. I've got it circled in red there where the punctuation was and how the King James was faithful to that. And it makes a better, makes it more clear. There's a separation between being equal to the angels and being the sons of God. We're not the sons of God because we're equal to the angels. That's two different things we are. One is equal to the angels. One is the sons of God. And if they were one and the same, it would not be necessary to have the punctuation as you see it. And now, that's the New Testament. The New Testament has a very different view of what the sons of God is than is being taught in the church today. But the church is drawing from the Old Testament, some of these teachers are, when they make these claims and they spin this narrative about there's these sons of God in heaven that are angels and these sons of God that are us on earth and they spin this, this narrative, but they, the new Testament, what the new Testament says is being under emphasized and not guiding their interpretation. Rather, it's some things that maybe some Jewish people believed in the first century. Well, those were the bad guys. Those are the guys who didn't get it. Those are the guys who were wrong. Those are the guys who opposed Christ. We want to listen to the apostles, and we want to listen to the New Testament and what it has to say about angels and humans. But, but let's go back and look and see if we can clear up some of the confusion 
of where they get these ideas with the book of Job. Let's look at the book of Job. When it comes to the doctrine of angels being God's sons as well as humans, the book of Job is the linchpin. It is the key because all the other references to the sons of God, they're ambiguous. They could be referring to people or they could be referring to angels. That is the case in Genesis 6. And in my book, I have an alternate explanation, maybe one you have not heard before, but they are people. And in the 82nd Psalm, the traditional view is that they were people, but the view that has come on lately is that this was something different. And so all these places where the sons of God are mentioned, and there's only a few early in the Bible, except for out of the mouth of the pagan king in Daniel. He says, I see one that looks like a son of God, but that, that is a pagan talking, and we, we understand that. And that, that's going to tie into what I'm going to say about Job, that the pagans had a different view of the sons of God than the children of Israel did. In the mind of the children of Israel, and according to the scriptures, Exodus 4.22, Israel is my son, and there are various Old Testament scriptures. Basically, it didn't change. It just got more clear from the Old Testament to the New that we are meant to be God's sons and daughters. If we receive the word of God into our heart with faith, it is supposed to put a, work a change in us, help us to be born anew, and conform to the image of the Son. But Job has the phrase sons of God in it three times where they seem to be spirit beings or angels. And in particular, Job 38, verse 7. It, it is unequivocal that it is talking about a scene before mankind, before humanity. And it says the sons of God there. And so what what is going on with Job? If, if angels are not the sons of God, then why does Job have a several places where it says sons of God that seem to be talking about angels and in one place unambiguously must be maybe maybe Genesis and Psalms and all those other places maybe the use of sons of God is ambiguous but they take what is said in Job and they say see sons of God are angels and then they shoehorn that view into all these other places in the Old Testament what I want to show you is the, there's two problems with Job. And once you see it, you will see that the case that the sons of God are angels is much weaker than probably you've been led to believe. So uh, there, there are two problems with Job. One of them is what Job really said. And the other one is how you view Job, even no matter what it said, no matter what it said, why Job is different. So let's, first of all, let's take a look at what Job says. And there's three sources to look at. One is the Masoretic text. That's the one that's in most of our Western Bibles. It was compiled from the 7th to the 10th centuries AD by rabbis who are hostile to Christianity. And yet somehow that is the text we use for our Old Testament. For the first thousand years of the church, we use the Septuagint. And that is the Greek version of the Old Testament. It is written in Greek and it was actually older. It, it was from maybe the second century BC to the first century BC, it was, it was compiled. And so the church used that as their Old Testament for about the first 800 years or so. It's still used by the Eastern Orthodox. Let's take a look 
at what these two witnesses say about Job, especially in verse chapter 38. So here is one reason why you should not take the verses in Job that use sons of God for angels to build a doctrine. The witnesses of the best texts do not agree. The Masoretic text, the one that is in most of our Bibles now, was not the Old Testament of the Christian church for the first seven or eight centuries or so. It still is not the text used for the Old Testament in Greek and Eastern Orthodox churches. They use the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of some Hebrew documents that we no longer have. And, but it was old. The Septuagint, they, they put most of it together in the second century BC. Perhaps Job was a little bit later translated. Maybe it wasn't translated until the first century AD. But this was the Old Testament. This is the Septuagint was the Old Testament of the church for the first eight centuries and still is for the Eastern church. We have the Masoretic text, but it was made much later by rabbis who were, were hostile to Christians. And after enough time had passed where they understood what needed to be fiddled with. And what I'm saying is if the Septuagint disagrees with the Masoretic text, you need to question it. You need to question it. And here they do. In each of the three places in Job where the Masoretic text says sons of God, the Septuagint says angels. Here in verse 38, when the morning stars sing together and all the sons of God shout for joy, you would think, oh my goodness, that pagan king in Daniel was right. The sons of God must be angels because there were no humans around at this time. Not so fast. The Septuagint doesn't say sons of God. It says angels. So then the writer of Hebrews, when the writer of Hebrews asks, where did he say something like this to the angels? Like he's saying to the son. In other words, the writer of Hebrews did not take angels to be sons of God. The Septuagint, if you look at Job, it doesn't have sons of God there. It has angels. And there's another witness there are several witnesses, and they say different things on this, and that's why it's unsound to build a big doctrine around it. There's a Targum, and a Targum was when they quit speaking Hebrew and started speaking Aramaic, they had to have people translate the Hebrew documents into Aramaic to give a Bible lesson. And so they would translate the Hebrew scripture into Aramaic, and then they would use that to teach the people what it said because they didn't speak Hebrew anymore. And so this is from the first century AD. It's, it's one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Targum of Job. We don't have very much of Job, but we do have a good chunk of chapter 38. And there the witness is different. And again, it says angels here in this case, when the stars shone in the morning and all the angels of God song. I don't get that part. But my point is the witness is different. So one reason why you should not build a doctrine that the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels is because the witness of the text is not in agreement among the, between the Septuagint, between the Masoretic text, and even the Targums that we have. And, and that is the linchpin under which this whole doctrine of angels as sons of God is being shoehorned into every place that sons of God is mentioned in the Old Testament. So you see, it's really built on a shaky foundation. But there is another reason why you should not use these verses in Job to, to come to the conclusion that God has this heavenly family of angels and they're the sons of God and then we humans are also, we're another family of sons of God. That whole doctrine is just, it's probably what a lot of the Jews of the period believed, but they were the bad guys. They were the ones who didn't get it. They were the ones who were wrong. We do not need to take our cues on what to believe from them.
We need to take it from the apostles and from the New Testament scripture, the canon of the word. Let's look at the second reason Job is wrong. So this procedure that they have done where they've taken where it says sons of God in Job and where it seems to refer to heavenly beings and they've said, aha, the sons of God are angels or heavenly beings. And so let's shoehorn that into every place it says sons of God, even though we know and we acknowledge the sons of God can also be people. They just sort of discount that part and say, it's no, every time it's mentioning it, it's these divine beings. And so one problem with that is the text is disputed. Job reads differently if you read the Septuagint versus the Masoretic text. It reads differently if you read the Targum of Job in the key place of, of 38.7 than it does from the Masoretic text. So that's one problem. We don't know if that has been accurately translated from the original document. The other problem, though, and, and here to some extent I'm using the, I'm doing what the scholars of the want me to do and say, consider each work within its own literary tradition, while at the same time I'm saying there's one Holy Spirit inspiring the whole Bible. But Job, according to Job itself, was a man of the East. He was not part of the Hebrew tradition. He was not a part of the Exodus from Israel. He was not a part of the stream of Abraham and the call, his calling out from, her, from Mesopotamia. He was not a part of the conquest and the, the books, the five books of Moses. He's a different cultural stream. And we know God called Abraham out of that cultural stream. They had, they had messed things up. Their ideas about God were not right. He did not want them to stay among them. He called Abraham out. And they had a different idea about who the sons of God were. I've already said it. I've already mentioned it. The pagan king in Daniel referred to a son of God as a divine being because that's what they believed the sons of God were. And when the Jews went into captivity... They picked up some of these ideas and took them out with them. The people in the East believed this stuff because they had pagan practices. I mean, the Babylonian god Marduk was said to have been the son of Ea. Yes, the same way you would pronounce the shortened version of the name of the true God. Again, back then they messed up. The, the real account of God and what he was trying to do. But Abraham was called out of all that. But that's another video. My, my point is the pagans believed that gods could have children who were also gods. They believed in the sons of gods who were also angelic beings. That was not what Moses was teaching. That was not what he was saying. But Job has a lot of terminology that is not found in the rest of the Bible. A lot of words and phrases not found in the rest of the Bible. That's because it's a different tradition. If a man of the East used the term son of God, that would mean one thing. But if Moses and the prophets and the writers of the New Testament use the term son of God, that means something else. That's all. That's all we have to understand. All we have to understand is that Job is different. The book is different. The phrase even if that was the right term, even if the original text in Job did say sons of God, it doesn't have to mean what sons of God meant in the rest of the Bible because Job is from a unique literary stream, not found elsewhere in the scriptures. And so I say all that to say there is one God, there is one spirit. He has inspired all the scriptures. It is up to us to understand though that and listen to teachers that teach soundly that there are different literary streams and we we believe what hebrews in the new testament we look at the old testament in the light of the new we see what hebrews says about the sons of god and it's us and the responsibility therefore it's more awesome that god wants to make us his sons and daughters and that 
we're the whole show. That we need to become what God has gone to a lot of trouble to allow us to be. Because it's not like he has a dozen different families and he's got this family up there, so it's okay if it doesn't go well down here. No, he wants us, friends. He sent his son for us. And I think we need to be awed by that. We need to be humbled by that. And that's really what our focus needs to be on and not chasing uh, other Elohim everywhere. And I'm sorry, that's the way I feel. I wish you well. Please study it and show yourself approved. Uh, thank you for listening, and may God bless you.